and welcome to A Little Bit of Genius. My name is Amber. I'm a senior at North Anglia International School in Rotterdam. I'm from California and enjoy doing anything your grandmother might like, such as crochet, sewing, and painting. And my name is Alex. I'm also a senior at Mesa. Unlike Amber, I don't have grammar-related talents. Instead, I enjoy watching television. Our guest today is Bertrand Picard, a modern-day explorer. Just to sum up, Mr. Picard, along with his colleague, were the first to fly all the way around the world in a hot air balloon. And later, he co-piloted the first round-the-world solar power flight. On top of all of that, he's a medical professional, a child and adult psychiatrist, and a hypnotherapist. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Really a pleasure. You know, all my stories started when I was a child, when I was in school, like you. So I'm really happy to answer all your questions. So first of all, we wanted to talk about your historic hot air balloon fight. What was that experience like for you? Well, you know, the Bratling Orbiter 3 was maybe the first big adventure that I did. Yeah. <laughs> the levels I had, the inspirations I had were not actors or football players. Uh, the inspirations were explorers. And all the astronauts, divers, environmentalists that I met as a child. Basically, I wanted to, to be an explorer like them. I, I wanted this type of life. A life where you go out of what you have learned. Because in school, very often, you learn what is scientifically proven. But exploration is exactly the opposite. Exploration is everything we don't learn at school because it is not yet known. So before I flew around the world in a balloon, you know, there was this long preparation. When I was 16 years old, I started to fly with the hang gliders because it was the beginning of that sport in Europe. And I thought, wow, that's for me, especially because I was afraid of heights when I was a, a young boy. And I thought, hey, that's the way to heal myself. You know, when you fly thousands of meters altitude uh, under a triangle of cloth and a couple of metal tubes, you really learn to behave, to focus, to be responsible of yourself. And then I was invited to cross the Atlantic in a balloon. And uh, that was my first big flight in a balloon. I was not a balloonist, really, but I was using balloons to jump with my hang glider. And we won the race. And then after winning the race, now the Atlantic, that was fine, but I'd like to fly around the world, nonstop in a balloon. So here, here is how this adventure started. And you see, it's not just that you have an idea and you think it will come by itself as a success. You, you need to work for it. Amazing. All of it. Just mind-blowing how you achieved so much. You know why? You know why I achieved so much? Why? It's because I took all the opportunities that life was presenting to me. Because each time I could have said, oh, no, I don't want that. I'm not a balloonist. I continue with hang glider. Or I could say, I'm afraid of heights, so there is no way I'm going to fly hang gliders. There is one opportunity I never tried. It's drugs. Drugs is something that is far too dangerous for the, the pleasure you get. So for me, it's useless. Beside that, there are so many opportunities in life that you can try. And sometimes you think, well, I don't like it. I stop or I like it. I continue. Have you ever read the book 80 Days Around the World? Yes. Yeah. Was that also an inspiration for you? Yeah. Jules Verne was an inspiration for my grandfather, for my father, for me. And uh, what I love with Jules Verne is that he's not writing science fiction. Mm. He's writing a story in anticipation. It means he's writing what will happen and not just an invention that will never happen. And this is why I love Jules Verne. Almost everything he wrote happened. Um, you mentioned you were afraid of heights, and that's really interesting for someone who is a lot of their career is built <laughs> up in the air. Um, is that something that is still with you, or do you think you've kind of overcome that at all? I'm, I am maybe not the guy who is going to walk on a rope between two buildings. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I could fly very high, very long uh, with hang gliders, with microlights, balloon, airplanes, solar airplanes. And uh, yeah, and I can cope with it. <laughs> you had three Breitling orbiters, right? Because the third one was the achievement, was the final one that worked. What happened to the first two? <laughs> The first one was the biggest failure of my life. <laughs> the balloon was inflated, and after six hours, six hours instead of three weeks, I was down in the Mediterranean Sea because of a big leak of fuel. Mm -hmm. And I felt miserable. I was crying like a child <laughs> who said that the earth was not built in one day. We're not going to circle it in one, in one time. So let's try again. 
And the, the second time with Breitling OB2, I, I flew to, to Burma, to Myanmar from, from Switzerland. And that was nine days in the air, more than nine days. It was the longest, longest flight ever of anything flying. So uh, in terms of, this, uh, of duration. So I thought uh, this is something interesting. It's encouraging. And the third balloon was clearly my last chance. <laughs> and when I took off, I can tell you I had butterflies in the stomach because I thought it's the last chance of making the dream of my life. And it worked. It worked, but there were moments of decisions that were crucial. For example, after 17 days, we were flying above Mexico and we had one quarter of the flight to do, 10,000 kilometers in front of us, and we had one eighth of the gas reserves. So if you just make the calculation, it doesn't work. But adventure is not about calculation. It's about going the, the furthest you can. So we decided that even if we had the risk of ditching in the Atlantic, we would go for it because we couldn't afford for the rest of our life to think maybe we should have tried. Yeah. Maybe we were too safe landing in Mexico. So we took the chance and we hit a jet stream that was so fast. It was 232 kilometers per hour. And we crossed the Atlantic in one and a half days. And uh, we had even enough fuel to make 5,000 additional kilometers above the Sahara to land safe in the morning in Egypt. Well, what was it like for 19 days in the hot air balloon? It was our house, you know, it was our little house in the sky. You do everything there. You eat, you wash yourself, you sleep, you go to the toilet, you fly the balloon, you make all, all the navigation and calculation. No, it was extraordinary experience. And I was always telling to the people who were locked down in this COVID-19 crisis, you know, they were in their house alone or with a family. I said, it's exactly like an adventure in a balloon. You don't know where you go, but you go with the present moment and, uh, and make it really a, an interesting experience, interesting adventure. So along with the hot air balloon, you also piloted a solar powered flight. Where did that idea come from and how was that experience? The idea of solar impulse came in the Egyptian desert just after the landing of Breitling Orbiter 3. Okay. Just one thing to the next. <laughs> yeah, because you know what happened? I took off with 3,700 kilos of liquid propane that was burned into the envelope to have the balloon stay airborne. And out of these 3,700 kilos, there were 40 kilos left at the landing. And this is the moment I thought, it's not the sky that is the limit. You know, people say the sky is the limit. Not at all, it's the fuel. The fuel is the limit. And I thought I want to break this paradigm of the fuel and make a flight where I don't need to refuel, I just can go forever. And that was the dream of the solar powered airplane that gets energy from the sun to run electric motors and store the energy in batteries. So that was the, the beginning of solar impulse. Were you ever worried about certain situations? For example, that time when you were in Mexico and you had one eighth of your tank left? You know, at this moment, I had no idea if I would succeed or not. And I was really afraid because the dream of, la of my life was vanishing uh, with all the problems we had. And I, I remember I took a big risk at that moment. I pushed the balloon to the absolute maximum altitude to see if I would find a better wind. At every altitude, you have another layer of wind that has another direction. So I remember that we were at 6,000 meters and at 7,000, there was not a better wind. At 8,000, not a better wind. At the maximum altitude I could reach, the wind turned and accelerated and I was back on track with Brian Jones to, to succeed. So really never be fatalistic. Ne never think, oh, it's too late. I cannot survive. I cannot succeed. Until the last moment, there's always something you can do. And when you decided to go on your balloon flight and the solar impulse, how did your family react to the decision? Were they supportive or were they like scared maybe? Because <laughs> it isn't every day that you decide to go on a balloon flight around the world. Yes, you know, I had crossed the Atlantic with a balloon. It was successful, but it was a little bit the luck of the beginner. And then I told my wife, I want to fly around the world nonstop in a balloon. And she didn't even raise her head. She was working on something and she just told me, you are far too lazy and disorganized to succeed in something like that. And uh, I did not say anything. And I started to work on the project. 
And six months later, I came back to her and I said, okay, I found a sponsor. I found a constructor for the balloon. I found the weatherman. I found the air traffic controllers. Do you think I can succeed like this? And she said, yes, yes, like this, you can succeed. And it was so funny, but you know, she really pushed me to my limits. <laughs> I love to have people who tell me it's impossible. I imagine it's the dream of my life and everybody would tell me, oh, it's easy. You have to do it. Of course. Yeah, we'll help you. So cool. What does it mean? It means that you are not ambitious enough. So when people tell you it's impossible, it means, wow, now I have a really interesting goal. You're listening to A Little Bit of Genius. In this episode, our students had the opportunity to chat with Bertrand Picard, an alumnus of Collège Jean Pité who has gone on to achieve global acclaim as a record-breaking explorer and balloonist. Learn more about us at nordangliaeducation.com and don't forget to subscribe. In a lot of your flights and things, you have a co-pilot or another person you work with. How important is teamwork for projects like this? Teamwork is crucial, but you need to understand what is teamwork. Teamwork, it's about comparing experiences. And when you compare experiences, you can never disagree. If we compare our experiences, I can learn from you, you can learn from me. And then we make a new relation where one plus one equal three. You, me, and us. If you disagree on something, you're going to tell the other one, that's really interesting. Where does this experience come from? What have you learned in life that is different from what I know? And like this, you, you don't compete against the other one. You compete against yourself to be better, to learn more, to understand more, thanks to the other one. So I, I prepared the, the crew like this with Brian Jones and with Audrey, it was, it was exactly like this. You know, he was completely the opposite of me. He was a jet fighter pilot and an engineer. I'm an explorer and a psychiatrist and a balloonist. You know, he cannot be more different. And because of this, we build this one and one equal three experience where we manage to always find a solution that none of us separately could find. And on top of all of that, you had the time to become a medical professional. Tell us about that. What made you go into medicine? Because I don't only have a father, I, al I also have a mother. <laughs> and my mother was very interested in philosophy. Uh, she was interested by spirituality. I spent a long, long time with her in my childhood, speaking about life, religion, why are we on this earth? What's the goal? And uh, very often she told me, I don't know. I don't know how to answer. And this is a fantastic gift you can give to your children. Saying, I don't know, because what does it mean? It means you still have something to discover when you grow up. And I became a psychiatrist because I thought that's the profession where I can put together my deepest wish to understand life and the profession. In a way, my father showed me how to explore the outer world and my mother showed me how to explore the inner world. And you're also very into sustainable and renewable energy, I know. So do you think being interested in human life led you to that? Yes, you know, an explorer is exploring because he's not satisfied with what he has, what he sees. And when I see the world today, it's exactly this. I am not satisfied by what I see. I see people polluting the earth just for short-term profit, personal advantage. They put millions of tons of plastic in the ocean, toxical products in the rivers, in the air. They modify the climate with toxical emissions. It's ridiculous. It's completely crazy. I cannot be satisfied with what I see. So what I really want to do now is show everything that we can do to make this planet in a better shape and, and to protect humankind, I would say. There are 8 million people dying each year of air pollution, only air pollution, without speaking about all the other pollutions. So it's unacceptable. There are so many inequalities in this world. It's really a huge, huge, huge problem to solve. And uh, what I want to do is to bring solutions for that. Because ringing the bell and say there are a lot of problems, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. I, I want to show there are solutions. And this is the work I'm doing now with my Solar Impulse Foundation. Um, how important is it not only to speak out about climate change, but to actually be making decisions that it's impacting the climate for good? Yeah, you know, if you think of climate change as a problem that will affect the next generations in 30 or 50 years, 
nobody will take action today. And if you say we have to take action today, you have a lot of people are going to say, we don't know how to do it. It's too expensive. We don't have enough money. We cannot change what we do. So what I learned also in my psychiatrist experience is that you have to learn to speak the language of the people you talk to. So if you speak to decision makers in the world of finance, economy, or politics, it's useless to say you have to protect the environment. They will tell you, we have 10,000 salaries to pay at the end of the month, and we cannot change everything. So what I want to do is to show them how much it can be profitable to protect the environment, how many new jobs you can create, how many new technologies you can introduce. And this is absolutely fascinating because you have the possibility to create jobs and to make profits by replacing everything that is polluting today by something that is more efficient, more clean. Because if we pollute so much, it's very much because we use old systems, old technologies. You know, most of what we are using was invented 100 years ago at the beginning of the oil era. In the combustion engine, you have 27% efficiency. So 73% of the gasoline you put in your tank is lost. In an electric car, you have 97% efficiency. You have 3% that is lost. Renewable energies will produce clean electricity clean movement, clean heat. So imagine the market of the century if you replace this polluting stuff by modern technologies. I read on your website that there are already planes that can fly for two hours on electricity. Yes, now the electric planes are two, three or four seaters. Now we need to put that on the level of commercial aviation. And there's a gap, of course, because if you need to transport so much batteries, it's going to be too heavy. So there are people who work on lighter batteries. And you have people who work with hydrogen. Because with hydrogen, you can put a liquid that is turned into electricity through a fuel cell. Yeah. And uh, you recover electricity and water. So it's a completely clean way to, to, to fly if the electricity is made from renewable sources, not with fossil fuel or, or coal, of course. While we're talking about exploration, what are your views and what do you think about space exploration? Now it's a really big thing with SpaceX and all the other multinational organizations working on space flight. Mars will be space exploration, but everything else is not exploration. It has already been made. You are, you are too young to have seen that, but I was personally in Cape Kennedy for the launch of Apollo 11, who brought Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. And that was absolutely amazing. The entire world was watching and that was completely new. Nobody had done it. If somebody goes to the moon now, for your generation, it will be exploration because you maybe forgot that it already happened. <laughs> yeah. But Mars, yes, Mars is really exploration. Well, I think that was most of the questions we had for today. Do you have any final thoughts? Well, I, I love that discussion with both of you. I hope that the students will understand that they can be explorers, they can be adventurers, they can be creative, they can be innovators as, as soon as they go beyond what they have learned. And we have to keep in mind that it's always possible to do better, to have an evolution, to learn from life. And I think the most beautiful exploration we can do now is how to have more respect for nature. How can we have more wisdom, more compassion, for, for other people and for everything that's around us. We need renewable energies, we need clean technologies, but we need also more wisdom, uh, more respect and more compassion with others. It's very important at your age to yeah. think in these directions and to, to understand also the, the choice we have in our lives, like in the balloon, to drop the ballast, to change altitude and find other directions in life. It's been really great to chat with you, Bertrand. Thank you so much for joining. Most welcome. To find out more about Nord Anglia, head to nordangliaeducation.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.